coming on the clouds. He's coming on the clouds. The kings and kingdoms will bow down. And every chain will break as broken hearts declare his praise. But who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. And every knee will bow before him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sin of the world. His blood breaks the chains, and every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Oh, every knee will bow before Him. Oh, so open up the gates. So open up the gates, make way before the King of Kings. God who comes to save is here to set the captives free. For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. And every knee will bow before Him. And every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb. Yes, every knee will bow before him. Who can stop? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? No one. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord? Oh, there is no one. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Oh, who can stop the Lord Almighty? Yes, who can stop the Lord Almighty? going here with How Deep the Father's Love. How deep the Father's love for us How vast beyond all
and the meditations of our heart be worthy worship for you this morning. So one of the stories that the casinos got to share with us this past year was, uh, was Rihanna's story. So if you haven't had a chance to meet Rihanna just yet, uh, she's going to be getting baptized this afternoon. We're going to be heading to the ocean. We're going to go to Crescent Beach to do that at 3 o'clock today. You're, you're more than welcome to join us. We'll be meeting at the volleyball courts there. But we, we thought that we might be just a beautiful part of even just celebrating uh, the Casito family, just to share Rihanna's story and testimony with us as a church this morning. Uh, and so I'm not going to say anything more than that. I'm going to invite Rihanna to come to the front, and she's going to share uh, just her story, her, her testimony, in lieu of what's going to be happening uh, this afternoon at Crescent Beach. Let's welcome her to the front. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm just gonna. Oh my gosh. Okay. I'm just gonna give a little disclaimer first. English is my second language. Bear with me. Um, so I would say my journey with faith started when I first moved with my homestay parents, Rainier and Marissa, and. Um, but before that time, um, moving here had brought me this feeling of isolation, loss, and disconnection. Hello. And <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. And um, sorry, I don't know why I'm so nervous. <laughs> And up to that point, faith did not have a place in my heart or my mind. And I had a really different perspe perspective of faith until I started exploring that aspect with Marissa and Ray. And they welcomed me to their home and accepted me as who I was, although I was really different from them. And they showed me and walked me through their life and who they were. I vividly remember the first... Sunday service that I attended with them and I sent a picture to my friends and they asked me if I'm meeting Jeff Bezos. <laughs> it was a sign of Jesus and they were a little bit out of the loop and I remember how foreign that whole aspect of life was to me and the love that everyone had for Jesus. Considering everything, they would still pray for me, they would pray for my family 
and they would talk about the Holy Spirit, but my mind still wouldn't accept um, that aspect yet. Moving out to go to college made me realize clearly that someone has to have a moral compass and with clear outline rather than just relying on their brain, especially if you are a dreamer like me, because brain can trick you into realizing the false things and considering them as the true way. And around the same time in college, I met Emily. She was a bright follower of Jesus. And I remember how odd it was to me listening to someone my age saying things like, Ray, I will pray about that tonight. Or she would say, I keep that in my prayers. Her perception of faith changed my view and emotions towards faith and made me want to explore that part that Rain and Marissa would always mention to me. With her, we went to church together. We prayed together, made mistakes, and asked for forgiveness. But unfortunately, um, Em left us on November of 23. And... Um, um, immediately after hearing the news, I called Rain, and he prayed for me, and for M and her family, and nothing gave me as much power and strength as those prayers, and in December, I moved back with the casitos a day before Christmas, and everything was different at the time, but they still accepted me with open arms answered all of my questions. We started praying every night and then prayer changed to reading Bible every night and finding my way to Jesus. Through the church, guidance of mercy and rain and M's light in my life, I began to explore my faith and my relationship with Jesus and my whole heart became part of it and I was hungry to do so. My grief with her loss and the growing presence of the Holy Spirit in my life slowly found it, found, found it easier to navigate to, through life. And I would also like to share you two verses that I first wrote down about Bible given to me by M. The first one is Psalm 16, 8. I have set the Lord continuously before me because he's at my right hand and I will not be shaken. And the second one is Psalm 14518. The, the Lord is near to all who call upon him in truth. And the little note we found in her room after she passed away. You are created to be close to God, hardwired. Nothing can keep separate, nothing can keep separate you from him when you are drawn to him. When you are drawn near God, you draw near freedom to peace, to security and love. Let yourself come to the presence of God, what it feels like to be one with Christ, what it feels like to have him by your side. Don't run from who you are designed to be. And at the end, um, I would like to thank my son, Ray, um, for helping me, okay, through this way. And I would like to thank Jericho and Journey for always giving me the motivation just to live in general. I love them. And I am filled with gratitude and joy as I prepare for my baptism. Declaring my faith is a testament to transformative power of God's love. I am a new creation in Christ, and I am ready to embrace this new chapter with faith. And I believe Jesus lived, died, and rose again and offered me a new life. Thank you. All right. Well, we are uh, beginning a series through the summer. It, it did kind of get off the ground a little bit last week, but more importantly, we're going to do a little bit of an overview this Sunday uh, on the book of Ecclesiastes. It's called Chasing the Wind. If you have uh, ever read it or spent any time in it, maybe immediately your heart drops and you're like, it does not feel like a summer series <laughs> in particular. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we got the opposite feelings in the back. Somebody's cheering and someone's booing. It sounds about right when it comes to the, the book of Ecclesiastes. Uh, if you aren't familiar with it, it is uh, 
very central in the middle of the Old Testament. It's not particularly long, uh, but it holds a punch to it. Uh, there is a perspective that is, I would say, deeply needed in relation to even some of the other wisdom literature that we see in the Old Testament. So we're going to talk about that this morning. And if you are a realist or a self-proclaimed realist, this book might seem like it gets you. And this teacher seems like a good guy that you'd, you'd share a meal with and you get along really well with each other. And it leads to this idea over and over again that, that life is random, it's uncontrollable, it seems beyond our understanding time and time again. And that feels deeply human in many ways. And for the author of Ecclesiastes, any attempt to try and control our lives leads us to this this word over and over again of being meaningless or maybe pointless to some degree. But in the midst of it, I want us to engage with this idea and, and come to an understanding of what he's actually presenting to us in a really real and tangible way. So we're going to d- jump right in. Let me pray for us. And as people come back with some water, we'll, uh, we'll begin. So, Father, we just thank you for your grace that's upon our church, upon this morning, upon your word that leads us to life. We just pray our hearts are ready and open to receive, that they might uh, be responsive and not too guarded. And if there are guards upon our hearts, even as we talk this morning, I pray that you would uh, knock them down to allow your spirit to rush in. Uh, We know that where your spirit is, we find freedom. So that may, may that be our story not just today, but as we go through the summer together. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Uh, I talk about it often. I am a a uh, self-proclaimed sports nut. Uh, I pay attention to far too much. My brain space is occupied with a lot of meaningless use, uh, meaningless sports facts on a variety of sports. Sports Center was and often is a primary thing that's on our television at home. Uh, So come the spring of 2015, my Calgary Flames did indeed make the playoffs. And so it was a big deal. It was a big deal. We thought it was a rebuilding year. We had low expectations. And then we got to that point in the year. And I was was like, I'm I'm a realist about where we're at as a team. I don't have any expectations. And then we made the playoffs and everything changed. Expectations, sky high. We're going to win every game. We're going to get all the way to the Stanley Cup. And then we did the impossible, and we actually won a round. The Calgary Flames are the kings of the mediocre winning strategy. They don't ever even win rounds. And so my expectation grew again. Man, we've won one round. Can't stop us now. And my expectation rose and rose and rose, and inevitably uh, it was crushed in that second round. I was living, uh, some of you know Mark. Uh, I was living with Mark at the time, and we would tell you that in our house, our emotions were driven solely on what was going on with the Calgary Flames for about two months. It was some high highs and some low lows. We had like the music going on the background. We didn't look, make eye contact. And it was this experience of when we think we don't have expectations, we certainly do. That when we have our expectations rise, it does something within us. And it's interesting that when we look at the book of Ecclesiastes, I didn't realize the expectations I had going in until my expectations were dashed to pieces sitting on the floor as I was weeping in front of it. And I think that's life. I think that we often make the statement that I don't have a ton of expectations around this. But when our expectations, though uncommunicated, are unmet, then we realize how they're sitting directly in front of us. This is the experience of our writer in Ecclesiastes. He has come to this experience of life where he has seen his expectations be dashed on the floor in front of him, and now he's writing out of that experience. I I thought that this was going to happen. I thought this was going to get better. I was going to follow a certain plan and proverb for my life, and It's going to lead to good things. But then when he looks at the experience of life all around him, he sees something completely different. So if you could turn with me in your Bibles, we're going to just go straight to Ecclesiastes chapter 1. 
and we're going to read just a couple verses together to maybe set the tone for what uh, he has to say to us, what the author has to say to us. So it says, the words of the preacher, some verses say teacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem, vanity of vanities, says the preacher, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What does man gain by all the toil at which he toils under the sun? A generation goes and a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun goes down and hastens to the place where it rises. The wind blows to the south and goes around to the north and around and around goes the wind and on in its circuits the wind returns. All streams run to the sea, but the sea is not full to the place where the streams flow. There they flow again. All things are full of weariness. A man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing nor the ear filled with hearing. What has been is what will be and what has been done is what will be done and there is nothing new under the sun. Super jolly, our our author this morning. And he's saying in the midst of this, the word vanity is used. Some translations, perhaps you're reading this morning, will use the, the language of meaningless. All things are meaningless, is his statement. It's almost this pessimistic approach that feels different than the optimist of, of Proverbs, perhaps. So to provide a little bit of a context around the book itself, you might have noticed right off the bat there's, there's two kind of individuals at work within this text. At the very beginning, there is an author that is presenting a teacher. It is, this, it is as if the author is sitting in front of someone providing this deep wisdom for them to understand. He's providing that for us to read. And then as we look at the text, uh, there's a number of different ways. If you're interested, you can... Take a look for yourself as well. We, we have a blog on the website. It's going to have more detail around it. We don't know for sure the authorship of the book. Some people contend that it is Solomon, uh, known for his wisdom. Some people believe it goes that route, but there's other uh, thoughts around it. Regardless, it is someone who is wise in nature, providing his wisdom of the experience of life for people to understand. And if anything, we need to look at it as someone who is a sharp, middle-aged critic, uh, someone that would talk about wisdom, and provide some reality to it. And he's saying that you think that wisdom will actually bring you success, and you better think again because life under the sun is is meaningless. And so the authors collected these teachings and these words, and there's three observations in this book. Our lives are just a blink in time. We're all going to die, and life is random. Again, this feels like an odd inclusion in a lot of the biblical narrative in comparison to the things that we maybe have read, even in the teachings of Jesus. And what it does is it pulls back on this false optimism and reality. Perhaps you've had a religious experience similar to this, that you walk into a church service and it's like, everyone seems to have a smile on their face. Nobody could actually feel that happy. And then you read something in the Bible that like, I, you can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And you think to yourself, well, that's not the way my life is. I certainly cannot do all things, and it leads you down this this dissonance of understanding to come to a conclusion, well, if that's who God is, and that's my experience, well, I can't simply believe that's who God is, because look at the world around me. And Ecclesiastes is this moment in which the author comes alongside you, this teacher comes alongside you, and he says, I see what you see. I experience what you experience, that it is often not exactly as we had hoped for or believed for or thought it was going to be, that even the words of Proverbs, which are often transformed into promises in our minds, don't seem to perfectly play out. For example, we think of the world and we think upon the areas of justice, and that if I do the right thing, then I'm going to get the right thing in my life. If I'm going to do something good, I'm going to get something good. And we hope and we believe that. We see that in the scriptures, and the Proverbs say that over and over again. If you do something that is good, the result will be something that is good. And simultaneously, if you do something that is evil or wrong, that will be the fruit of it. And then we get to the reality of life and we think to ourselves, that isn't what I see. Why are good people experiencing bad things? Why are people who are certainly doing evil in the world, causing pain, causing harm, causing suffering, why are they experiencing what would be characterized in some sense as success? 
whether it's financial, whether it's notoriety, whether it's just simply this, this security that they would have that we might long for in coming from a good perspective, there's a dissonance between that. And then we get to Ecclesiastes, and he says, I see that too. That I see that there's good things that you're trying to do, and then sometimes it doesn't lead to the results you're hoping for. And he calls it hevel. Everyone say hevel. Within the first two verses, it provides us, in many ways, the theme for the book itself. This word hevel is, in the original Hebrew, the word for, uh, we, we see it translated as vanity or as meaningless. And that's not perhaps the perfect translation, especially for our modern day understanding of words like vanity. A vanity is often thought of as maybe like a vanity seat where you think about putting on makeup, or vanity is simply thinking about pride or the way that you look in particular. Vanity holds that kind of understanding. And then meaningless would lead us to believe that the author has looked upon all that life has to give to us and comes to the conclusion, well, it's not going to be that good by the end of it. And if you want to get an understanding of the book of Ecclesiastes, we need to understand this word, hevel. Hevel is a word, and it's used about 40 times within the 12 chapters. And it's a metaphor literally meaning smoke or vapor. And what the author is going to do is he's going to run everything through this grid and he's going to do so with these little thought experiments and he's going to say I saw a guy who was really wealthy and then he died alone and poor this is Hevel I saw a righteous man and he was really good and everybody loved him but then all his kids died and horrible things happened to him that's Hevel and he's going to do all these thought experiments of how screwed up life is under the sun, and he's constantly going to call it Hevel, Hevel, Hevel. And over and over again, what I think he's trying to capture this, it's so, it's so brilliant, he's using this metaphor that smoke, vapor, is something that's beautiful and mysterious. It takes one shape and then it moves to another. There's a randomness to it. There's a desire to maybe grab hold of it. Have you ever tried to grab hold of smoke? Or maybe you see like a, a kid that sees a, a flame providing smoke and they try and grab at it. They try to grab hold of it for themselves, but they can't. That is the idea, the metaphor that the author is trying to present to us. That in many ways, it's all hevel. That it's like the smoke, it's vapor that we try to grab hold of to control. And it does not hold a form that we can do so in that way. He's not necessarily saying that life is meaningless, but rather that its meaning is often unclear. And therefore... It is disorienting and uncontrollable. There is, I heard this thought a number of years ago from, from Tim Mackey when he was teaching on Ecclesiastes, and he was talking about this idea about the myth of religious fulfillment. That the reason why we engage in any kind of religious experience or any kind of relationship with God is that we believe that if I do the good things within a religious path, then I will experience the good things that God has for us. And yes, there are most certainly truths to that. If you, if you think about it in the most practical of ways, if you engage in good practice, in good community, with good habits, certainly there are good things that come out of it. But we also know in our own experience, those moments in our life where randomness interrupts our day-to-day -day good habits and good experience and causes everything to fall apart. This idea of the myth of religious fulfillment can be extremely disorienting in even understanding who God is. If we simply believe that God is in our lives to simply make our lives better, then when life is not better or life is not going in the manner that we had hoped for, suddenly our relationship with God falls apart. If the foundation of faith is that God makes my life better. That is a foundation that is not able to persevere through the realities of our day to day. And so what we need to look at is asking this question of ourselves. Why do I even hold faith? Do I hold it simply so I can interject God into my life to make it better? 
Or is there actually more to it? Is there a relationship within it in which I place God at the center of my existence instead of the additive to make my existence better? The myth of religious fulfillment is one that is talked about over and over again within this text, asking that question and asking that question so that we can move past this place of simply good for good and bad for bad, but engage with the reality of life. So this is what I want to do this morning. Uh, In this space, we get a chance to have a little bit of a conversation. And so in, let's say, rows to a piece, yeah, let's do I would love for you to turn and face each other. And I just want you to engage in a question. Uh, I want you to have a little bit of a conversation. And I want you to ask the question very simply. Uh, have, you, have you given in to the myth of religious fulfillment at moments in your life? That God is simply in it to make life better. Ask the question, have the conversation, and then see where it goes. I'm curious what some thoughts are in the room, and then we'll bounce around, okay? So turn around to have a conversation with people around you, and we'll come right back. Yeah, I I deeply appreciate that this book is in the Bible, because I think it's necessary for us to be be able to look at it and be like, oh yeah, God really does get me. He really does understand what I'm experiencing. It's not just in the good. It's not just, it's not just in the moments where I seem to understand it. It's in the moments where it feels like just chaos, randomness, unfairness, unjustness at play in the world around us. Christopher Wright has this, he talks about the challenging differences between wisdom books and it arises when, when one author, like the teacher in Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes, when he doubts or questions the validity of basic affirmations in other parts of the body. But this is precisely the purpose of the books in this uh, collection of scripture. They compel us to an honest faith that's willing to acknowledge the presence of doubts that we cannot dismiss and questions that we can't always fully answer given our human limitations. And here's the thing. In Ecclesiastes, he does acknowledge the perspective of moments in Proverbs. He says it's a really good idea to learn wisdom and to live in fear of the Lord. And he also says we need to learn to live with an open hand because you really only have control over one thing, and that's your attitude towards the present moment. And so we'll talk about this more throughout the summer, but it's this invitation to be present in the moment and enjoy it. And he uses the framework of of a meal, of a conversation, as can we actually experience the beauty of that moment to make it good? And so this is, again, not to name all things as meaningless, but just in the fact that we can't explain what all things mean. But there certainly is good to be found in it. And then asking ourselves from that place of religious fulfillment, that myth that we buy into. What if I have the wrong set of expectations altogether? What if God's promises to me under the sun, by which he means in this broken world that is compromised by evil and compromised by sin, what if God's promise to me is actually not to solve all my problems? What if that was never his promise to me? And what if his promise was actually Not that my life may go better and that all my dreams would come true, but later that it's revealed in the cross that God actually enters into the hevel, the vapor, the randomness of human existence, and takes it on himself. What if the purposes of God in our life is to be with us in the moments of the randomness of now so we can place our hope in him for the future? What if it leaves you and I in a greater position of humility, where even though I might not be able to grasp at the meaning of life, I'm going to presume to say, therefore, life has no meaning because I can't explain it? No. It's not based upon my interpretation of the moment. And this is the the punch in the gut of Ecclesiastes. Just because I can't see the sense of life or the meaning doesn't mean that it has no sense. And he's going to come at this position over and over again. I think that this is just a really relevant word for us where we are at in our cities, in our our world, where it feels like there's so much going on around us. 
and in a culture in which it feels like, yeah, you get 70 years, your day under, under the sun to do all that you can to make your life meaningful. And even as Christians, we have this mindset that like, we have to just do everything we can to make this moment meaningful. And we do it by our own strength over and over and over again. And it sets us up to fail. And ultimately, it leads us to this myth of religious fulfillment. And it reverses the gospel. The gospel is telling me that the story that God is writing is one that he's working out in the world around us. And he's calling you and I to play a bit role in that story that had a climax on the cross and the resurrection of Jesus. And the myth of religious fulfillment says it reverses it, actually. They say that it's about me inviting God into my story so that I can get all that I had hoped for and longed for and dreamed for. And then when it doesn't happen, I get angry and I blame God. And it's like, well, which way do you want it to be then? Ultimately, I'll end with the the words of this guy, Robert Short. He says, the Ecclesiastes is essentially a kind of negative theologian. He's asking questions that can be answered only by a future revelation of God. And clearing the road for this revelation, he smashes any and all false hope to pieces. Ecclesiastes is the Bible's night before Christmas. Ecclesiastes is human self-sufficiency stretched to its absolute limit and found sadly wanting. I know listening to this perspective, it's not like the most joyful sermon in the world, can be a little bit depressing. But at the end of the book, what he leads us towards is he spends significant time talking about the reality of life, and then he brings the reality of God for us to know at the end. He doesn't want us to lose hope. He wants to make us humble and into someone who trusts their life in God. And even when it doesn't make sense, even when we can't explain it, that one day that God will come and will clear all the hevel all the chaos, all the uncertainty, all the brokenness, and he will bring peace and justice. The hardest thing in this life is to live well, and we need a guide who's going to help us understand why so much of our existence is marked by weariness and formation. The power of Ecclesiastes is that we're going to be taken by the hand through life under the sun so that we might understand the dangers of seeking meaning and fulfillment without the one who provides those very things. This book offers no cheap answers, but in fact, I think it confronts the harsh realities of life to show us what gives our life meaning, and that's ultimately our connection to God. So this is what I want to do this morning. Uh, As we close, as we just take a moment in this space, uh, it's getting warm up here, I recognize that, Let's, let's take a moment. I'm going to ask you to close your eyes. And if you're, if you're able, if you feel comfortable, if you would extend your hands. I think we can all name moments in our lives where it felt like we were doing the right thing and we got the wrong or the, a, a different result. That we were just going along our way and death found its way into our family. We were just going along our way, and we didn't get the thing that we had spent all of our time and energy into. We'd done all the things. We checked all the boxes. And with open hands, I wonder if we might offer to God just to take away any resentment, any anger, any pain that still has a hold on our heart from a moment such as that. Because if Ecclesiastes is doing anything, it's offering us to look at life straight in the face so that we know that we can bring all of it directly to God. So a moment in which you feel as if things did not go as expected, as what it seems was right, actually. The loss of a family member or or a child The diagnosis that we had not thought was even possible, but came our way. A job being completely taken away from us that seemed to have so much meaning and purpose. 
and yet it was just gone in a blink. A dream that we had on the forefront of all the things that we were doing, that we were putting the time and effort necessary to make it happen, and it simply did not. I want you to name in your mind where resentment or anger or bitterness or frustration towards God has crept in and taken root. And it's almost made you hesitant to pray. It's made you hesitant to hope. It's made you hesitant to believe. Because to have no expectations at all in your mind just protects you. So we ask the Spirit of God with our hands open, with the burdens that we have carried from situations that we did not expect, from the randomness and brokenness of this world, we ask you would heal our hearts, that you would carry our burdens. Maybe it's a broken relationship in the family that kind of came out of nowhere, and your heart is just burdened by it. And you're just begging God for Do something. May we find your grace healing us right where we are. That we come as we are to you right now, Spirit of God. We rest on you.